Hey there. So I'm back from a two-week trip in Europe, and my season's done, and it was a great season. I exceeded all my goals, all my plans. And so I've been taking stock of that to try and offer you some lessons that you can apply in your own training. So hopefully you can experience the same sort of thing, you know, your best season ever. And so I just wanted to highlight a few things by kind of walking through my season. And some of these uh, you can start applying immediately. So I wanted to make those available to you. So we're going to shrink me now. We're going to put me in here. Now, what is this? This is the performance management chart from Training Peaks. And I did a video on how I use Training Peaks that explains kind of what you're looking at. But let's just give you a quick rundown. This blue line with the shading underneath it is a way of looking at my total training load. And load is the interaction between volume and intensity. And that is over, say, a six-week horizon. And then this pink line that looks a little more volatile but generally follows the blue line is acute load. And that would be seven-day, one-week uh, loading. So when it's above the blue line, that blue line is going to trend up. And then there's a concept called training stress balance, TSB. That's the yellow line. And the zero mark is right here going across, and that's when you're, when you're at zero, you're balanced. So you're not going up and you're not going down. So you, you would be stable. Um, and so it's just a way for you to tell how hard uh, you're pushing things. But let's just talk about the first thing that I managed to get right this year, and that is season pacing, pacing the season. So this starts, it runs from October to the end of July here. And we're talking right now at the end of July when I've wrapped it up. So you'll see the first few months are really about just getting the body going, nice balanced training. I was working on my running as well as building up my strength training. And I wasn't pushing the volume or the load. I was very patient uh, with my approach across the winter. Don't fight the weather. Don't don't be doing a whole bunch of hard stuff. There was a little bits of more challenging stuff in there, but it was basically just stay put and train across the fall and winter months. And then as we get into February, I did a swim focus block, and that swim volume is what's driving things up. And then we get into spring, I add more cycling volume, I hold the swim volume, and that's moving things up again. So if you're going to have a year as a triathlete where you're able to push the total volume up, it's usually going to have a strong cycling component as well as a swim component. One of the risks of trying to push the run volume up is that our legs get beat up, so we're not able to do as much uh, cycling. And also we run the risk of injuries. And I talked about how I had injury last summer that sort of held me back a bit. So the other thing I want you to notice is as my line starts climbing, it kind of keeps climbing all the way to the end of my year. There's a little bit late spring where I went to a bit stale and a bit flat, and I think I had a little too much intensity in my program. So you might want to watch that with yourself. If you find that all of a sudden you feel like uh, you're a little on edge, look at your approach to intensity. So what I did then was I stopped swimming with my group and I swam on my own. So I maintained my swim, but I, my swim intensity, there was only a little bit in there and there wasn't much in the way of sustained stuff. And what that did was it freed up recovery capacity for me uh, to focus on bringing that bike volume up because I was focused on a seven-hour race, but out of those seven hours, round numbers, four hours and 45 minutes of it was related to a very challenging bike ride in that race. So that's something for you to bear in mind. You'll have a structure that works in the winter and early spring, and that might be a challenging swim structure. Uh, I was doing group swims, uh, and they were great for me. They brought my swim up. But then I, when, I, when I went into maintenance mode, I had to back off on that swim intensity because it wasn't specific to my needs for my race. My race only had a 2K, 2.2K swim in it. So that's something for you to bear in mind. Things that work in one part of the season 
might not work in the other part of the season. Also, you need to have the maturity to say, hey, that's not working for me. I don't want to get tired that way. And that might be a case of with group rides or very anaerobic, very red zone type training that might happen, track sessions, other things. What I did was I stepped back from all that with my training partners and I did that stuff on my own with lower doses. And that enabled me to bring up my total volume and specifically my bike volume. So bear that in mind. The other thing is your approach to training zones. Now, I've talked quite a bit about setting your zones. You can find those videos. And uh, there's, we've got a chapter on it. We've got chapters and videos on lactate testing. My approach, even more simple than what you read in all that. So I'm using a three-zone model, which is basically green, tempo, and red. And green is up to and around that first lactate threshold. Red is above the second threshold, the second lactate threshold. It's kind of those hard efforts and tempos in between. Now, in between each of these zones, like so when you go from green to tempo and you go from tempo to red, there's going to be a transition area. And that transition area typically is referred to as high zone two or low zone four. Those, And some folks call them gray zones. I've been known to call them that too. So when I'm focusing on my three zones, I want to be in the zone. So I, I try not to spend too much time in these transition areas. So my green training is up to uh, that first lactate threshold, but it's mostly under that. And my tougher training, my tempo training, I can do longer doses of that because I'm in the middle of that zone, that high zone three, uh, low zone four type effort. And it, it's really more of a high zone three for me. Now, again, I'm training for this year, I was training for a seven hour race that had a lot of tempo climbing in it on the bike. So that was very specific to my needs. And then my red zone stuff, I only do a tiny bit, just a little dash uh, of it. And it is high intensity, but I'm not doing it every week and I'm not generating a lot of fatigue from it. So that sort of training is designed to lift all my other training and support my other training. So I train all the zones, but if you look at my distribution, it's a, a pyramid, but it's a very wide pyramid. That zone one portion is very wide at the bottom and it's supporting uh, everything across the entire year. Now, specific. Specific training needs to be specific to the demands of your race. So I think one of the things you want to watch for is this desire that we all share that we think we need to do something hard when it's time to get specific and really challenge ourselves and suffer a bit in the training. I would say save the suffering for the end of your event when it gets difficult. You want to really protect and pace your mental mojo. So if you're in training and it's starting to feel really hard, I would recommend you back off a little bit. Um, that's something I do. And what it does is it enables me, both my physiology and mentally, to have the stamina to get through the entire year without a setback and also to keep that load kind of progressing all the way towards my A event. Now, brings up final couple points. The A event, I didn't back off. Once that line starts climbing, it kind of keeps climbing all the way. So you'll see one little peak here, and that was a volume peak when I did a volume-focused, bike-focused training camp. And then this last two weeks of my season had quite a bit of intensity in it, but it was specific intensity, tempo intensity, getting ready for my race. And the race went great. I was very surprised at how competitive I was. So I finished, there was about 1,800 people there. There was an elite field and an amateur field. And I was in the 55 to 59, which I, I won. Uh, there was a couple of very accomplished French athletes uh, behind me. And we would have won 
uh, the age group below us, and I would have finished third in the 45 to 49. So it's a very good benchmark. So I've been thinking about why, and this video is part of that answer. Next time, we're going to talk about something else that I do very differently from all the other athletes that are at my level. And I think it might have an impact on the reason and my rate of adaptation, why I seem to be improving uh, so quickly relative to myself, but also why I'm closing that gap so quickly on the fastest people uh, in my category. So we'll talk about that next time. Want to hear about that? Head over to my YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button. I got a lot more stuff coming your way in the weeks to come. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.